morning's sermon comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, so I invite you to turn there with me as we read the first 10 verses together. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. This is God's Word. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Amen. It's a Christmas tradition growing up in my household that on Christmas Eve, my father would pull out the VHS cassette tape of Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. I don't know if you've seen that movie. I hope that most of you have. It's one of, uh, it's touted to be one of the greatest films of the 20th century. But uh, you'll remember the story of Mr. Bailey, who takes over his father's loan business, and under the hard hand of uh, Mr. Potter, struggles to keep his business afloat, and it comes to a very difficult time in his life where he decides to end it all. He jumps off a bridge into the river below. But as you know for well, Clarence, the angel, saves him, pulls him out of the water, and gives him a gift to see what his uh, city would have been like if he had not been born at all and shows him what a profound difference his life has had not only on his family but on the town as a whole. It's a wonderful movie and this first chapter of Thessalonians, Paul does something similar here for the Thessalonian church in that he wants them to see what an impact the gospel has had in and through them, not only in their own church, but in the city and in the countries around them. And so as we begin to unpack this passage, I want to remind you of a couple things about this letter. First of all, of course, Paul is the author, but he may have co-authored this with Silas and Timothy, who are his traveling companions on this missionary journey. And he writes the letter about 50 or 51 A.D. So this is one of the earliest letters that we have from Paul. He writes from the town of Corinth to the town of Thessalonica, both in modern-day Greece. And you'll remember from Acts chapter 17 that what has happened in Thessalonica is that Paul and his traveling companions have come there, and they've had to flee the city because of a mob started by some of the Jews who were uh, opposed to Paul and the gospel. A mob has thrown the city into an uproar. They've brought some of the Christians in before the city authorities, and they've told Paul, you better get out of here if you want to live. So Paul and his companions flee Thessalonica, and they're unable to return. And so Paul writes 1 Thessalonians uh, for his concern for the church, having not been able to return and see how they are. So that's where we find ourselves as we enter into this first chapter. And here's the three points I want us to consider today as we consider the power of a Christ-centered life, namely in the Thessalonian church and in Paul and his disciples. We see this in three ways. First, the Christ-centered life is saturated in prayer in verses 1 through 3. The Christ-centered life is saturated in prayer. Secondly, the Christ-centered life is an incredible example of faith, verses 4 through 8. Thirdly, the Christ-centered life 
has been transformed by the gospel in verses 9 and 10. And we'll see these examples from both Paul's life and the life of his companions as well as the life of the Thessalonian church. So let's dig in and take a look at this first point that the Christ-centered life is saturated in prayer in verses 1 through 3. Look, namely at verse 2, as Paul says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to note two things about Paul's prayers here. This includes Silas and Timothy, as he says, we. But we want to note first the frequency of the apostles' prayers. Look at the words he uses to describe the frequency of their prayers. First, in verse 2, he says, We always pray for you. And then shortly thereafter, we constantly are remembering you in prayer. Three words, always, constantly, and remembering. The idea of remembering is a constant, ongoing activity that Paul and his companions are engaging in as they lift before the Lord the Thessalonians in prayer. So we see that Paul and his companions' lives are saturated with prayer, but we also want to note the content of their prayers. We note the frequency, but we also want to note the content. Look at verse 2. What are their prayers composed of? We give thanks to God. Thanksgiving. Their prayers are firstly composed of thanksgiving. Secondly, in verse 2, they mention and remember the Thessalonians in their prayers. Supplication. They come before the Lord praying on behalf of the Thessalonian church. And look how Paul ends his verse in verse 3. We remember before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now those three words should sound familiar to you. Faith, hope, and love. That's a recurring theme that we see in Paul's letters. And we see it as part of his prayers. That as he prays for the Thessalonians, as they lift them up before the Lord in prayer, they're not just praying for their sickness, or not just praying for their well-being. They're not just praying that they're doing okay. But they're concerned about their spiritual life, their faith in Christ, their labor of love in the gospel, the hope that they have set on the Savior. And these are the things that Paul and Silas and Timothy are praying for the Thessalonian church. They're thanking God for them and lifting them up in prayer. Now, a life that's saturated in prayer like this ought to be a life of power. Because we see throughout Scripture... That prayer is powerful. And the power of a Christ-centered life is composed of many things, but it cannot exist apart from prayer. Prayer is essential for the Christ-centered life. And when I say that the Christ-centered life is to be saturated in prayer, let me speak to you grill mates out there, you barbecue guys out there. What's one of the most important things as you prepare to put a piece of meat onto the grill? It's really what you do beforehand when you marinate that piece of meat, isn't it? You let that breast of chicken soak overnight in a bag of marinade, or you suit up that steak just right with the right seasonings and the right sauces to make sure that the flavors permeate that meat so that every slice that you take is full of flavor and juice. That's what the Christian life is supposed to be like when it comes to prayer. Every aspect of your life, whether you slice the beginning or the end, is filled with that juiciness, that flavor of prayer as you're constantly, always remembering others in prayer as you go before the Lord, thanking God for them, praying for their spiritual well-being. Is this how you would describe your life of prayer? I think if we're honest with ourselves, we all know that our prayer life could be stronger. It could be better. We could pray more often. We could pray longer. We could pray more sincerely. We could not fall asleep when we pray. There's all kinds of things that could improve our prayer life. It's hard for us to pray sometimes. 
And so it's important for us to be very intentional as we seek to incorporate prayer into the Christ-centered life. So let me give you some very practical advice here on how we can incorporate prayer into the Christ-centered life so that the Christ-centered life is a life of power. Number one, schedule prayer into your day. We have smartphones, we have Outlook calendars, we have all kinds of things that we keep track of stuff on in order to make it to this appointment and that meeting and make it there on time. But it's important, practically, to schedule time for prayer. Put it into your calendar. Make it a reminder in order to schedule prayer into your day. That's the first thing, practically, that will help you saturate your life in prayer. Secondly, as you pray, use Scripture to guide you. Use Scripture to guide you. It's hard for us to pray, and often we don't know what to pray or how to pray. But when we open the Word of God, and we see the promises and the blessings that are laid out for us there... We use those to come to God in thanksgiving and in supplication as we come to Him in prayer. Use Scripture to guide you. So now these next two applications come from this passage itself as we use Scripture to guide us in prayer. Thirdly, thank God for His blessings. Now that's something very simple that we already have known how to do since we were children, to say thank you, Lord, for the blessings that we have in our lives. But what we note from this passage is that Paul is thanking God for others, for other believers, for the Thessalonian church. He's thanking God for them, and he's thanking God for the gifts he has given them and the ways they have used those gifts to engage in a labor of love, to increase their faith in Christ, to make sure that their hope is firm and secure. And so when we thank God in prayer, we ought to thank God for people as blessings. One theologian writes this about a life of prayer. Without a prayerful contemplation of divine blessings, there can be no attitude of thanksgiving. Without a prayerful contemplation of divine blessings, there can be no attitude of thanksgiving. When we come to the Lord in prayer, in thanksgiving, it's important for us to contemplate, to meditate upon the blessings that He has bestowed upon us. Not just the house that we have, or the car that we have, or the good food that we're about to enjoy. Those things are important to thank Him for. But what Paul gets at in this passage is that he is thanking God for the profound spiritual influence the church is having in and around Thessalonica. And that's what we ought to pray for. Pray for you and your influence in your life and in the lives of those around you. Fourthly, from this passage we see that we are to remember others in our prayers. Not just in thanksgiving, but in supplication. It's often hard to sit down and pray for a long time. We think that maybe if we can pray for a really long time, God will hear us if we repeat the same things over and over again. Or the longer we do something, the, the, the better the, the stars go after our name in God's checkbook or so. But one of the things that's so important to do is to really take our time in prayer. And it's okay to be silent in prayer. It's okay to go before the Lord in silence as you pray. And listen for the Holy Spirit as He guides us in our prayer. It's a practical application as we seek to pray more often. It's okay to pray in silence. It's okay to pray for others specifically, not just yourself. We want to pray for ourselves, of course, but not just ourselves. It's easy to fill our prayers with me, 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 me. But it's important for us to be intentional about praying for others. And here's a very practical way for you to do that. Use a church directory. Get a copy of the church directory, which is just now being updated. Put that on your desk, by your front door, wherever you may be. And pick up that church directory as your alarm goes off on your phone to remind you to pray. And pray through a few families on that directory. And you will have no shortage of time in prayer. As you think about the people of this church, what's going on in their lives, your concern for their spiritual well-being, and spend some time praying for each other. It's very simple to pick up a directory and begin to pray for the souls of those who are sitting next to you every Sunday. Paul and his companions show us that a Christ-centered life is saturated in prayer. 
and they, along with the Thessalonians, now want to show us a second point, that the Christ-centered life is an, ex- is an incredible example of faith in verses 4 through 8. Look again here with me. We're going to see from two different parties what an incredible example of faith there is for those in the gospel, first from Paul and his companions, and then from the Thessalonian church. So look at verse 5 with me. Paul writes that the gospel came to the Thessalonians not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. And you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. Here we see Paul, now think about this, Paul and Silas and Timothy. They're on a missionary journey. They're traveling all over the ancient Near East, the Mediterranean. You know Paul's life and the things that he's faced in his missionary travels. This is not the first trip he's made. It's not the first short-term mission trip to Thessalonian uh, church there that he's made. But he's been through some very difficult hardships, both physically and spiritually. And yet again and again and again and again, we see Paul continue throughout the ancient Near East, the Middle East, the Mediterranean, entering into these hostile, difficult situations, and he proclaims the gospel. And look at what he says about how he and Silas and Timothy proclaim the gospel. They proclaim the gospel in word with power. The Christ-centered life is full of power. And as Paul and Silas and Timothy proclaim the word of God, they do so with power. They do so with the power of the Holy Spirit, he says. And they do so with full conviction. There's no wavering on Paul or Silas or Timothy's part about what they have to say about what Christ has done. But with full conviction, they march into these cities over and over again, fully aware that they know death is around every corner for their so-called blasphemy. And they boldly proclaim the gospel in the midst of these trials. What an incredible example of faith Paul and Silas and Timothy give to us. It ought to be an encouragement to us as we consider our own lives that that same power that Paul and Silas and Timothy have is the same power that's in you. The Holy Spirit who lives within you enables you to proclaim the gospel with word and power and with full conviction. It's not necessary for you to cower in fear as you think about sharing the gospel. It's not necessary for you to be concerned about what others think as you share the gospel. But as you live and speak the gospel into the lives of those around you, you do so with power and with full conviction as in confidence you share the truth of what Christ has done on your behalf. So we're reminded in this one verse of Paul and Silas and Timothy as they've been through hell and back in their missionary journeys, boldly proclaiming the gospel over and over again. But Paul's not ultimately concerned about himself. He wants us to continue to look at the Thessalonian church. So look in verses 6 through 8 as we pull out six different things the Thessalonians are doing, showing what an incredible example of faith they give us. Verse 6, you became imitators of us, that is the church imitated Paul and Silas and Timothy, and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. All right, here we go. Six things the Thessalonians are doing to show an incredible example of faith. Number one in verse six, they became imitators of Paul and Silas and Timothy and of the Lord. As we look at the Thessalonians, I want you to look at your own life. How have you done this? How have you become an imitator of Paul, of Silas, of Timothy? How have you become an imitator of Christ? You've done it. The Lord has worked it in you. You are imitating him as you grow in your faith. How have you done this? How have you seen the Lord work in your life? And on the flip side of that coin, how have you become an imitator of the world? We do it all the time. Whether we mean to or not, we imitate the world in all sorts of ways. How are you doing it? You know how you're doing it. Think for a second. There's a way in which your life is imitating the world. And if somebody looks at it, they can see it. And you can see it. And here's where prayer comes in. Lord, help me to be an imitator of you. 
and to no longer imitate the world. Secondly, the Thessalonians in verse 6 received the word in much affliction. This word affliction refers to the persecutions that Paul has experienced and the Thessalonians are experiencing. They've been dragged out of their homes, taken before the city officials, stripped of money, of belongings, threatened. They're in the midst of real persecution. And Paul says they received the word in the midst of it. They didn't reject it. I don't want this to happen, so I'm not embracing the gospel. I'm not interested in that. Instead, they received the word in the midst of great affliction. Now, we don't experience this kind of affliction here in America right now. And yet, many around us refuse to receive the word. In the midst of comfort, in the midst of wealth, in the midst of happiness, the word of God comes to those we love, comes to our neighbors, and they reject it. And this ought to be, again, a call to prayer as we're burdened that in the midst of ease and comfort, the gospel is being rejected. And so we come to the Lord in prayer asking, Lord, we ask that your word be received even in the midst of this comforting time. Thirdly, the Thessalonians have received the word with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember doing this? Maybe for the first time? Hearing the truth of the word in all of its fullness and the joy that was a part of your life as a result of the Holy Spirit working that in you. Do you remember that? Has that happened in a while? Maybe you've received God's word begrudgingly sometimes. We we come to church again to listen to the word of God again and we have to be here for some reason or another. And begrudgingly we walk through the doors and begrudgingly we sit in the pews. It happens all the time in our lives because we still struggle that fight against spirit and flesh. But Paul reminds us of the Thessalonians that they received the word with the joy of the Holy Spirit in the midst of great affliction. Fourthly, the Thessalonians became an example to all believers in verse 7. The Thessalonian church became an example to all believers. They're a young church. They just embraced the gospel. They just came into being. And yet this rookie church becomes an an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, in all the area around Greece and ancient Asia Minor. How have you done this? I want you to reflect on your own Christian life. You've done these things. This is not for you to compare yourself to someone greater, but for you to look and see what Christ has done in your life. How have you done this? How have you been an example to believers in your own life? You've been an example. Sometimes we have the privilege of seeing how we've been an example to our children, to our neighbors, to our co-workers. In many ways, we're not sure exactly how we've been an example, but the Lord has worked in our lives to be examples to others. And we know this from experience that children, that non-believers who are watching us and seeing the way we live, they learn a great deal by our example. They learn by our words, yes, of course, and we must use our words, but they also learn by our example. And what kind of example are we setting for our our children and our neighbors and our co-workers and our, our friends, those who are around us all the time? What kind of example are we setting with our faith? I'm not talking about external behavior. That is wrapped up in it. But I'm talking about your spiritual example and how you handle the challenges that are thrown at you in life. How your faith stands firm in the midst of affliction, as the Thessalonians has. They've become an example to all believers. Number five, the Thessalonians sounded forth the word of the Lord in verse 8. This is a great uh, Greek word here, sounded forth. This word is actually used elsewhere in ancient Greek writings to describe thunder or the barking of a thousand dogs. That's the way that the Thessalonians have sounded forth the gospel. Thunder has exploded out of Thessalonica. It's like a a rabid group of dogs barking loudly, drawing attention to what's happening. This is what the Thessalonians have done in embracing the gospel. It's sounded forth from them. And again, look at your own life. How have you done this? You've done it. The gospel has sounded forth from you in many ways. What has the Lord done to make that happen in your life? How has he used your gifts and experience to make that happen? If Paul were to write... First Tallahassians, 
to us here at Westminster, how would he say the gospel has sounded forth from the Tallahassians? What would he say about Westminster? How has he used us? He's used us and he continues to use us. How will he use us? That's where prayer comes in. Use us, Lord, and let the gospel sound forth from us. Sixthly, the Thessalonians, faith in God has gone forth everywhere, Paul says in verse 8. He says it's gone forth everywhere so that we don't even have to say anything. Paul and Silas and Timothy, as they're going around explaining the gospel, teaching the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, they don't even have to do it because the Thessalonian church took over their role. They've sounded forth the gospel. Their faith is known everywhere. That's what can be said about us. I hope it's the case that... As we continue to grow in faith, as we continue to saturate our lives in prayer, that our example is an incredible example of faith as the gospel explodes out of Westminster, as it sounded forth and the echoes throughout Tallahassee and the surrounding area. Have you ever been asked this question? Why can't you be more like your brother? Why can't you be more like your sister? And that's such a painful question to be asked, isn't it? Maybe you remember as a kid being asked that question or a teacher maybe who had your brother or sister in school. They asked you the same question. It's a painful question for a child to be asked. And that's not what Paul is doing here. It's easy to to see what Paul is doing here and to think, oh, the Thessalonians are, that's the goody-goody classmate. And we all have to try to appear as good as the Thessalonians. But what Paul is doing as he lays out the example of the Thessalonians is Paul... And Silas and Timothy and the Thessalonians are running a race. They're running a race of faith. And they see you there and they're saying, come on, run with us. Come on, look at what Christ is doing through us. He's doing it through you. Come on, run with us. And they're running and they're calling you alongside them to run the race of faith with them. That's what Paul is doing here. He wants you to run. He wants you to run with him. He's the good leader. He's been there. He's done it. He's doing it. He's going ahead of us. He's running with us. And for centuries, and for centuries after his death, others have taken up the baton and have run the race. And they're calling us, come on, run the race with us. Run it. We need to be imitators of the Thessalonian church. We need to be imitators of Paul and of Silas and of Timothy. We need to be imitators of the Lord. And let me encourage you, your life is an example of incredible faith in Christ. Because Christ is at work in you. And he continues to work in you. In the midst of affliction, in the midst of trials, in the midst of good times, he's working in your soul to make you an example so that others pick up the baton and run the race with you. The Christ-centered life, a life of power, is saturated in prayer, and it's an example of incredible faith. Finally, in verses 9 through 10, the Christ-centered life is transformed by the gospel. Look with me at these verses. Paul writes, For they themselves, that is, those who have heard of the faith of the Thessalonians, report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Three things that he says about the Thessalonians here. Number one, they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They turn to God from idols. There's been an incredible 180 that has taken place in the life of the Thessalonians, a culture that has been ensconced in and enveloped in idol worship. Their entire lives have been devoted to it. Their daddies did it. Their mamas did it. Their grandparents did it. It's been a part of who they are, and they're no longer doing it. They've rejected not only the idols themselves, but an entire cultural experience that is a part of their being, of who they are as Thessalonians. The second thing that Paul says is that they now wait for his son from heaven. They understand that Christ is to return. And that's part of what Paul deals with later in in this letter. But as they wait for Christ, they're not just sitting. Waiting is not just sitting on the sidelines kick back and waiting for Christ to show up. But we see that the Thessalonians are engaged while they wait. They're working while they wait. They're doing while they wait. 
And that they have embraced the truth, thirdly, that they believe in the risen Jesus who delivers from the wrath of God. They understand the truth of the gospel. They understand the seriousness of sin. That God's wrath hovers over the sinner. And unless somebody does something to remove it, that wrath is coming down on the sinner. They understand that it's Jesus who delivers from God's wrath. And they understand that Jesus has conquered sin and death. That he is alive and that he will return. And as they wait for that return, the Thessalonians are actively engaged in ministry. In 1864, John G. Patton, who's a Scottish Presbyterian missionary, married his wife Margaret, and they headed into the South Pacific to an island called Aniwa, which is part of the modern-day island nation of Vanuatu. Listen to what he writes as they arrived on this island nation in 1864. The natives were cannibals and occasionally ate the flesh of their defeated foes. They practiced infanticide and widow sacrifice, killing the widows of deceased men so that they could serve their husbands in the next world. Their worship was entirely a service of fear, its aim being to propitiate this or that evil spirit, to prevent calamity or to secure revenge. They deified their chiefs so that almost every village or tribe had its own sacred man. They exercised an an extraordinary influence for evil, these village or tribal priests, and were believed to have the disposal of life and death through their sacred ceremonies. They also worshipped the spirits of departed ancestors and heroes through their material idols of wood and stone. They feared the spirits and sought their aid, especially seeking to propitiate those who presided over war and peace, famine and plenty, health and sickness, destruction and prosperity, life and death. Their whole worship was one of slavish fear, and so far as I ever could learn, they had no idea of a God of mercy or grace. Now Patton admitted that at times his heart wavered, as he wondered whether or not these people could be brought to the point of weaving Christian ideas into their spiritual consciousness. But he took heart from the power of the gospel. And in the next 15 years, he and his wife Margaret saw the entire island turn to Christ because of the power of the gospel. This is the power of the gospel. The Christ-centered life is a life that has been transformed by the gospel. If the gospel can turn an island of cannibals into followers of Christ, the gospel can transform you. There's nothing so evil that you have done. There's no sin so great that it is more powerful than the gospel. The power of the gospel can transform you. To throw away the idols, to throw away the sin, to turn to Christ for salvation. And believer, let me tell you something. That power is in you. And the Lord uses that power through you. He uses it through you in prayer. He uses it through you in your example of faith. He uses it in you to transform you into his image and to proclaim the gospel to the world outside these doors. There are men and women who are waiting for your example. They've been waiting for a long time. And they're waiting to hear the good news of Christ. They're waiting for your prayers to be lifted up to God on their behalf. They're waiting for the transforming power of the gospel. And Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and Christ are saying, come on. Come on. Run the race with us. And see the power of a Christ-centered life. Let's pray.
God, as we come to you in prayer, we come to you boldly and confidently because we know him whom we have believed. And it's in the name of our only mediator, Jesus Christ, that we are so bold to come before you and ask for you to move and to act and to use the power which you have given us to be saturated in prayer, to be an incredible example of faith, to be transformed by the power of the gospel. Lord, we know you are at work, and we want to be a part of that work. So work in our lives to make us like Christ. Work in our lives to pray for others. Work in our lives that as opportunities arise this week, the gospel would be sounded forth from our lips, from our lives, from this church. Lord, let us not stand on the sidelines, but run the race with you, enjoying all the benefits that come as believers in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.